Ms Simak, Mr Rainey, um, can I just tell you that we have read the skeleton arguments. Thank you very much indeed. Um, there is outstanding the application in relation to the letter, but also in relation, and it's a linked application, as to whether or not um, the appellant should be allowed to pursue ground three. Um, what we are going to do is we're going to hear the arguments and then go on to the substantive appeal and the, the judgments will obviously take into account um, all arguments both as to whether or not we're going to permit the fresh evidence or the ground to be run, which is a linked, as I say, question, um, and anything that flows therefrom. So I hope that's um, clear. Um, have you been able to um, contemplate the share of time between you? It's not something that we have discussed. I All mean, right. All I right. would have thought that we had enough time during the day to deal with it because there are only three grounds of appeal and the respondents' notice grounds are not particularly long. I would no. All right. So, well, we can keep our eye on the time. We've got a day set aside. All right. Okay. So, I think then, Mr. Tanfield, you should start the batting in relation to the ancillary application. Uh, lady, yes. Um, it, it is a very short application, which is simply to admit um, the letter of claim, uh, which I hope that your, uh, your ladyship and your lordships have seen. Uh, it's in various places, but if you have the um, application bundle, it is at the back of the respondent's notice in the application bundle. Or it's also at the back of the supplemental bundle. Uh, it's pages uh, 11 and 12 of the respondent's ancillary application bundle. Uh, and the, the point of that letter uh, is simply that it refers to the potential to forfeit. And it says that uh, very clearly in the second paragraph. Uh, it says it's our, in the third, fourth, fifth lines on page 11, it says it's our client's intention to prepare and issue a notice pursuant to section 146 of the Law of Property Act, uh, and therefore thereafter seek forfeiture of the lease. And uh, in, in broad terms, the reason why uh, we sought to put that letter in is because of the way the argument runs. So it, it's all, in fact, you have to have a little, you have to have an eye on grounds one and two as well. So what, what my learned friend's ground uh, two says in particular is that the costs in front of the uh, county court and the FTT, which is the contractual costs claim, can't be incidental to a section 146 notice. Uh, and then ground three picks up on the other part of the clause, which refers to in contemplation of, and then says, well, there wasn't any evidence uh, to support an argument that the costs were in contemplation of uh, a section 146 notice. Now, the, the way it was put, uh, it, very broadly, and I, I can develop these in more detail, but the way, the way it was put in front of the district judge was to concentrate on the words incidental. And I accept that that's the way it was put, because you can see it in the transcript. Um, but, and I don't obviously blame him for this, he was in person, but there was no one there to say, actually, they can't be incidental to, which no doubt, I would say, would have made junior counsel say, well, if they're not incidental, they're in contemplation of. And then somebody would have said, well, but you haven't got any evidence of that, to which the answer would have come back, well, let's have a look at the letter of claim. Uh, and so for those reasons, which I put very, very shortly, then I would submit that the position is either there shouldn't be permission to run ground three, because it's effectively taking a new point and then saying, you haven't got any evidence, and therefore you lose. Or the point can be taken, but the evidence should be admitted, which completely deals with the point. Okay. Can I run a couple of points past you? Um, 
First of all, if you take your side's skeleton argument for the hearing before the district judge, which is the supplemental bundle beginning at page 180. Yes. And turn on in that to paragraph 16. Yes, very clear. Um, that ends up by saying there was no requirement in that instance to show that the landlord had contemplated forfeiture. And nowhere in the skeleton argument, as far as I can see, is there any reference to the contemplation limb of the contractual uh, clause. So this no. rather looks as though at that stage the council was saying we don't need to show contemplation. We're not relying on that. that that's, I have to accept that that is the way junior council was putting it at that point to the district judge. Um, in fairness to him, because that hearing in January 2019 was before the Court of Appeals decision in West India Key, which effectively kills off that argument. Because in West India Key, the very same argument was run uh, by quite experienced uh, landlord and tenant council, Mr. Bates. And it was uh, in that that it was said, well, actually, you do need uh, some evidence. And I can show you where this argument is advanced. If, if your lordships and, and my lady have the authority, it's bundled at uh, tab 19. Uh, that's the West India Key case. And uh, if I may, I would, since it's a short point, simply jump straight to the point in the judgment, uh, which is uh, page 168 of the law report, or 323 uh, in the top right-hand corner. And uh, it's at the very top of the page, which is the tail end of paragraph 50, and then paragraph 51. Uh, and so at, at the end of paragraph 100, and, sorry, at paragraph 50, uh, it is recorded that it was said no notice of intention to bring forfeiture proceedings had ever been intimated by the landlord to the tenant. And then paragraph 51, Mr. Bates had argued this didn't matter, irrelevant, um, and he says it's enough to show that the costs had had to be incurred before it would be possible uh, to forfeit the lease. Um, and then at paragraph 52, he says, well, you can get that uh, from freeholders of 69 Marina versus Orem, which, of course, was what junior council was relying on in front of the deputy district judge. Um, and then at paragraph 53, uh, the, the Court of Appeal, which I think is Lord Justice Henderson, uh, refers to the case of Barrett and Robinson and says, uh, actually, uh, Barrett and Robinson is right, uh, rejects Mr. Bates's submission. Paragraph 54 says you can't get uh, this point out of 69 Marina because the factual circumstances are different. In particular, there had been a 146 notice. Um, and then at paragraph 57, uh, in talking about in contemplation, I accept he's talking about in contemplation, but he says you need to have an investigation of the landlord's state of mind. Uh, and I said in my skeleton argument that thought logically the same would have to apply to an argument that things were incidental to yes. a notice. So that, that uh, if, if junior counsel had made the submissions he made today, then uh, that would be a, a rather um, unwise thing to have done. But at the time that it was advanced in front of the deputy district judge, it wouldn't have looked so unwise, because the point hadn't been effectively terminated by the Court of Appeal. But you did have Barrett and Robinson already. He did have Barrett and Robinson, that, that is absolutely right. Um, and I, I have to accept that, that that was there, and that's, that is the way he put it. He was uh, effectively, uh, I think I'd have to accept, he was shortcutting the point about contemplation and saying to the district judge, well, it's sufficient that they're incidental to, and, and that's, that is enough. Yeah. But as I understand it, you now accept that, that even on the incidental limb, one needs evidence that, as to what the landlord's intention, contemplation was, that, that Section 146 proceedings were intended to follow. Um, I think I would, would be um, 
I think I would find it difficult not to accept the logic that if you haven't actually served a 146 notice, which, which you well can't, not. which you can't under the Act until you've had the amount determined. That, that is right. And in 69 Marina, as, as Lord Justice Henderson pointed out, they did actually get to the point of the 146 before it got to the Court of Appeal, certainly. Um, so if you've served a 146, the point disappears, because obviously you contemplated it. Um, and if you've served a 146, then obviously, I would say, uh, it's incidental to the 146. If you haven't served a 146, then West India Key is binding authority that you do need something to tie you back to the clause. And I, I, I think one has to accept that even to tie back incidental, logically, there must be something to tie you to the 146 notice. Because it's perfectly possible to go to the tribunal and have the amount of service charge determined, even if you have no intention of forfeiting at all. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. And that is the point which is made. And, and I think one, one of the Deputy President's cases, he found that that was the case, that, that um, there was nothing to suggest that Section 146 proceedings were in contemplation at the time at all. That's right. That's the actual decision, I think, in Barrett. Yes. Um, in Willans and Ken Square, it goes the other way around, which, of course, is why I asked to look at the, the letter. In Ken Square, it's dealt with very simply. It just says, well, look at the letter of claim. That told you that it was in contemplation, and that's good enough. Um, in, and this is a point I'll come on to, because of, there's Malone Friend's witness statement, which he wants to put in late, which denies that the letter was received. Um, you say that's not relevant. What's relevance? What's in the landlord's mind? Precisely. So it misses the point entirely. It doesn't matter whether he got it. What matters is it was prepared and written. Um, and uh, in, in Willans, the, the point was uh, decided on the basis of an internal communication between the client and the solicitor, which the other side could never have seen. So that's, that's why I say that. So just coming back, you get to the hearing before the deputy district judge. Um, as you say, at that stage, uh, Mr. Hardman is pinning his colours to the mast of incidental. Um, but as you also recognise, that might be thought to require some inquiry into the landlord's state of mind. Um, Mr. Khan doesn't raise the point, but since you've got to the hearing of your application, you presumably have to be ready to deal with whatever points are made by Mr. Khan at the hearing. There, was, there wasn't going to be further hearing. No. You had to have whatever you needed at that hearing. Uh, logically so, my lord, yes. Do we even know whether this letter was available at the hearing? Well, I, 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 I was going to come on to this if, if I were um, effectively driven off <laughs> my primary position. There, because it, it, it is not the case uh, that there had been no reference to this letter at all. Uh, and it's not the case, as that witness statement says, that the first we've ever heard of it is, is effectively during this appeal. Uh, if I could ask um, uh, my lady and your lordships to look at page 9 of the supplemental bundle. Uh, you, should, you should find there the, the second witness statement or, or Miss Ikinchuk. Uh, this is a witness statement which was filed, I think, uh, about a week before the hearing, uh, following a direction of a different district judge. Um, and it was to bring matters up to date. And um, in paragraph uh, 7 on page 10, uh, the deponent says, in answering the court's specific question on costs, which I don't need to know what the question is, I enclose and mark the claimant's statement of case from 1st of June 2017, which clearly outlines the basis of our cost application to the FTT. And uh, that exhibit begins at page 12, and it is headed, page 13, applicant statement of case. And it is, in fact, because it's a statement of case, supported by a statement of truth on page 22 from Miss Iqbal, who is a solicitor. And this uh, makes a rather different point. Uh, if you turn uh, to page 16, uh, 
at, at paragraph 14, um, Miss Iqbal recites the clause, but here she emphasizes the words in contemplation of. And then at page 15, over the top of the page, she says, and she refers at paragraph 15 to the letter of claim attached herewith as Schedule 4, indicating their notice of intention to issue proceedings pursuant to Section 146. And uh, she says at 16, then she says the costs of an incidental fee, which is where Mr. Hardman came down. And at paragraph 17, she says the applicant averts that the costs were incidental and in contemplation of. So she says both things in that statement of case. Uh, now, uh, before your lordships ask the obvious question, my slight Achilles heel on this is that although the statement of case was there, the schedules to the statement of case were not. So I'm in the position that originally Mr. Khan, his memory, with all due respect, is, is, is faulty on this. Originally, he had had the letter of claim in the first tier tribunal appended to this statement of case. The statement of case is put before in the evidence before the deputy district judge. The letter itself is not there. But um, if I'm driven off my primary position, then I would say perhaps I don't actually need the letter because I've got secondary evidence of it from Ms. Iqbal in this statement, and this was in front of the district judge. So to, to answer, that's a long-winded way of answering my Lord's question. Wouldn't you have been prepared? What I would suggest is that uh, junior counsel, if quick enough on his feet, would have said, ah, actually, look at the witness statement. I, I've got enough here, and re refers to the letter. And, and in reality, he probably wouldn't, I would suggest, have had to say, I rely on secondary evidence, and that's good enough. What would have happened is the district judge would have said, well, can we have a look at the letter, please? And it would have been produced. Assuming it was there, which we don't actually know. But he might have asked, if you were sufficiently quick, he might have said, could I have five minutes, please? I'll get the letter from my instructing solicitor. It may, it may be um, that on the basis of that, that actually I don't need to succeed on my application for the letter itself because I can get enough about the landlord's state of mind from the evidence of Miss Iqbal. And although this was prepared for the first tier tribunal, it was exhibited into evidence in the county court and it is supported by a statement of truth. And frankly, the, the, the reason for going for the letter itself, I'm, as I'm on my feet now, I'm starting to regret it. It looked like an easy win <laughs> on the basis that in Ken Square, it says, look at the letter of claim and that's enough. And perhaps it wasn't quite, quite the easiest goal to, um, to shoot that I thought it was. But in my submission, I can get there through this letter, if, so, sorry, through the statement of case, and the evidence of paragraph at page 17, even if I can't persuade uh, this court that the letter itself should be admitted into evidence. So this postdates the first year tribunal's decision. And it was ordered by another district judge or another deputy the, to form part of the cost application before the county court. So the, the, the applicant's statement of case, which is the exhibit, yes. uh, dates from 2017. And that was the costs application, the wasted costs application, or, or Rule 13 costs. Before which, the first year tribunal. Before the first year tribunal. And then this second witness statement that you've taken us to postdates that determination. Yes. But although there was unreasonable behaviour, there was going to be no award of costs. That's right, my lady. And this was ordered by another district judge for the purpose of the hearing that subsequently took place in front of DDJ Paul. Yes. Um, it was filed on the 20th of January of 2019. Do we have the order that directed that? Because we can probably see what the judge had in mind as being missing from the papers be considered by the court. If you bear with me one moment, my lady. I think I do know which order this is. I think it's page 66. Yes, 17th yes. December 2018. Right. Yes. Right. So 
So it was it was it was intended. The query was what what were tribunal costs uh, and what were uh, court costs uh, and how the costs which were claimed, which is the twenty three thousand, had been incurred. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so that witness, I didn't show you it, but the it the exhibit goes on to produce the cost schedule which had been in front of the FTT, which was I think for seventeen thousand pounds odd. Um, although I should. Uh, say that as far as I can see, that FTT uh, schedule itself included county court proceedings. So there was an attempt to get the FTT to order the county court, and then when that didn't succeed, then you go back to the county court. Um, whatever the position is, just to be clear, I, I do not suggest for a moment that the FTT had any jurisdiction to award county court costs, and you can see that from Avon and Child. But nevertheless, oh, I wasn't there, that's what was asked for. Uh, so, it is on that, that basis that I, I move my application to put that evidence in to the extent that I need the letter. Um, as I say, if, if I don't uh, succeed on that, then I would say I can still run the ground based on the secondary evidence of the letter, which very definitely was in front of the Deputy District Judge. And this wasn't challenged, this assertion in paragraph 15? No. Um, as I say, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't explain why Mr. Khan now says that he didn't, uh, uh, th that there was no prior reference to this letter, because it very definitely was referred to in 2017, even if he didn't get it at the time when it was sent. It, was, it had been referred to previously, so he's definitely wrong about that. He's right that it wasn't referred to in front of Deputy District Paul by junior counsel. He's definitely right about that. But the evidence was there in the form of, of this schedule. But but I do come I do come back uh, to the to the starting point, which I would submit it goes back actually to the point about whether ground three should be permitted at all, because I'm only driven onto this ground because ground three takes a point which wasn't taken in front of the district judge. Now I fully accept that you could say, well, he's Mr. Khan's a litigant in person, he doesn't know the points, counsel should have been prepared and so on, but nevertheless the point wasn't taken. And as a general proposition... And the I'm burden's sorry. on you. From the what? burden's on the local authority, not on Mr. Khan. What was the point that wasn't taken? I'm sorry. I'm well, the, point, the point, Mr. Hardman ran a point which we now know from West India Key is a bad one. And he simply says, well, I, don't, I, I can simply say this is incidental to a 146 yes. and I don't need anything more. And no one says, actually, you're, you're wrong about that. You do need something more. You do need something to tie the 146 notice or the idea of the 146 notice back to the contractual clause. You can't simply say, well, I've got my contractual costs clause, therefore I win. But is, 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 is this too simplistic? To tell me if I'm being stupid. Mr. Hartman puts it on one basis. The incidental basis. Yes. He wins in front of a district judge. Yes. It doesn't matter that whether that's because Mr. Khan argued it badly or didn't argue it at all or whatever, but this, he persuaded the district judge that it was incidental. Yeah. We now know that was wrong. You accept that was wrong. We, we, well, I only accept it was wrong without some evidence to tie it because I, I'm not conceding that with the benefit of knowing. Yes, yes but, but on the material before the, the, that was before a district judge. Um, he shouldn't have simply said, said it's incidental. No. So you now want to put it on a different basis. You want to put it either on the basis it was in contemplation or that it was incidental, and we've got the evidence actually. Why yes. why why is it Mr. Khan who's trying to run a new point? Isn't it you who's trying to run a new point? Um well, Mr. Khan is simply saying, I'm a litigant in person, I don't want to pay these costs. I mean, he's, he's not actually articulating it much more than that. No, I, I see that. I do see that point. I'm, I, I would still submit that, um, given that he put in quite a lengthy skeleton argument of his own, and, and it is really a very lengthy document, and he takes an awful lot of points, and he doesn't, he doesn't take that one, and the hearing would have developed differently, uh, in my respectful submission, had that point been taken, because it would have been obvious uh, I would suggest to Mr. Hardman that he couldn't take 
a shortcut, which later was found to be impermissible. Um, so the hearing would have developed differently. And it's a, it is a very short, it's a very short point. I, I, understand it's a, I understand it's a very short point. I understand if you get a letter in, you say well, it's a slam dunk. But, but, but I'm, what I'm querying is, is, mm. is whether it's Mr. Khan's responsibility that this point wasn't before the court. Because my untutored way of thinking would be, you had two ways of putting it, either contemplation or incidental. You chose to put it, when I say you, obviously, I mean Mr. Harden, as incidental. That may have looked like a perfectly good way of putting it at the time, and it did persuade the district judge, but we now know that to be wrong. And it's now you who want to put it in a different way. No, I, I'm not at all sure that's Mr. Khan's responsibility. Um, I, the way I would put the way I the way I put it, and I'm not sure I can elaborate it more than this, is simply to say that um, the case is the case is put in a particular way in front of the district judge. It's argued on both sides, and the district judge makes his decision, and he favours my client. Then in the grounds of appeal, a point is taken, which is a dual point, which is effectively, well, you, if you, because the ground two says you shouldn't have said it was incidental in the first place. And then ground three says, effectively, well, you might have said it was in contemplation, but actually you don't have any evidence. And so running those two grounds together, then you can't succeed. So it, it's a... It's a let's neat. suppose ground three is not there. So, so that Mr. Khan doesn't raise the contemplation. And it's you who want to raise the contemplation point. It wasn't there at first instance. It's a new point. It may be a good point, it may be a bad point, but, but it is a new point, isn't it? Um, I can see that I can see that, that rocking back onto contemplation would be a point which was not taken back in front of the district judge. Um, but in, in terms of the evidential lacuna, then that would appear to, as I understand the appellant's case, that is that is said to apply to the entire district judge's decision, and therefore, even on the intention point, sorry, the um, incidental. incidental two point, yeah. then the hearing would have developed. Uh, it would have developed. I think I understand the way you put it. So that that Thank that you. is the way I put it. Yeah. But if I am wrong about that, then uh, and, and that they do not require permission, uh, or that permission would be granted, because obviously this court can give permission anyway. Um, the principles are all set out in the Unstorfer case. Um, I don't know whether you would. Chips of requir requirements. Well, it might be a good idea for um, Ms. Simak to think whether she wants to run it at all, round three. And hoist you by your own petard. <laughs> because it was a, a different basis that the um, district judge, or deputy district judge, was persuaded to take to reach a conclusion that you say should be upheld in any event. I would have. It's a matter for my own friend, my lady. But I, I, I would have thought that that was a, um, uh, a, a courageous uh, <laughs> route to take, uh, or particularly on the basis that one hasn't gone through grounds one and two, and so one doesn't know actually what they are yet. Well, it's her opponent that's linking grounds two and three. She may persuade us that they shouldn't be linked at all, but we'll see. In any event. Anything further? Um, Lady, no. As, as long as it's effectively clear that I that I have three points. So point one is, don't give permission to run ground three. Point two is that if and or that if I'm wrong about that, then do give permission for the further evidence. If I'm wrong about that, I don't need the further evidence because I've got enough in uh, the statement of case from the FTT to satisfy the test, which is simply, a, according to West India Key, about the landlord's state of mind. And internal communications will do. It doesn't matter whether the letter was received or not. It's simply to tie it together. And, and I do make a point, which I, which I haven't elaborated orally. It ought not to be difficult to do, because the uh, test under the contract the, the highest it gets is contemplation, for example. Contemplation is not decision. Uh, decision cannot be taken, of course, until the FTT has ruled or the county court has ruled, because you can't even think about serving a notice until you have got a determination in your favor. Um, at the beginning of the process, clearly, uh, to use the old the um, Cundiff and Goodman analogy, things by definition are never going to have descended into the valley of decision. It can only ever be 
highly contingent. And as long as it was in the mind of the landlord as they're going through the first stage, the, the Section 81 stage, then um, I would respectfully submit that it ought not to be too difficult to persuade a court that actually uh, forfeiture or Section 146 notice, to be more accurate, was in contemplation and that and all that the costs were <coughs> incidental to that notice, even if at the end of the day the notice is not in the end actually given. Because in this case, <coughs> as your lordships know, the local authority didn't in the end press what I would call the nuclear button of forfeiture uh, and went a different route. <coughs> but they ought not to be penalised for that. Can I just talk that through a moment? You say don't give permission for ground three. Fine. No permission for ground three. You still need the evidence, don't you? Or you still need to rely on the existing evidence for incidental. It doesn't seem to, uh, allowing in or not ground three, doesn't <coughs> seem to make any difference to what you need evidentially. Yes, I think your lordship might be right. I think I'm, I'm, I might, yes, I think I, I, I may need to say something about the evidential position anyway, um, simply in order to run the respondent's notice, ground and one. And putting it the other way, from Mr. Khan's point of view, probably ground three can be dispensed with because you say um, you win on incidental and contemplation or you effectively you lose on incidental and contemplation. There doesn't seem to be a distinction on the facts. Certainly the ground three and the respondent's notice and the further evidence application, they're, they're all effectively facets of the same point. I, I think I have to accept that, yes. As I say, for all the three reasons I gave, the one thing which doesn't happen, I would respectfully submit, is that, is that uh, my client ends up trapped by a, a, a decision of junior counsel as to how to frame the skeleton argument, because the, there was enough there in front of the district judge had the point been taken. I appreciate this court may not approve of sort of shortcuts, but at, at the coal face um, in, in the county court, um, where there cases are listed and have to be dealt with rapidly. One does have to make, I would respectfully submit, certain allowances, in, including, for instance, in, in the Deputy District Judge's judgment, which he had to give off, off the cuff. So um, uh, I, would, um, I would at least say that in, in, favor, of, uh, in favor of junior counsel who, who argued it. It was a very, in the end, it was a small sum in front of a Deputy District Judge in the County Court. Is there anything further on that point I can assist with? Anything further? No, no thank you. So, um, Ms. Simak, do you do you want to pursue ground three? If I could just very quickly take these pictures down. Yes, of course. Um, I need an instruction. We would abandon. And what do you say about the application to admit the fresh evidence, the letter, in relation to the other, well, the basis of the decision, which was that the costs were incidental? What do you say about um, the application to get this letter of 2016 before the court? In its actual form. My lady, the main point as to this letter, of course, would be cost related. But um, because, of course, on the respondent's own case, this is a fresh piece of evidence. And they, on their own case, also admit that it's not until, um, not until the 2nd of March 2022, that they've announced that they are going to rely on that letter and produce the fresh letter. Well, that's the actual letter, but um, we've just been taken in the supplementary bundle to the, the witness statement, which refers to the letter by date and also by um, a summary of the content. And um, what Mr. Rainey is saying is that 
uh, that would be sufficient evidence to satisfy the evidential burden as to notifying or, or, or being in contemplation of the forfeiture. It's um, paragraph 15. Page 17 of the supplementary bundle, do you have it, Ms Simak? What, what do you want to say about that? Indeed, that evidence will have been before the district judge court. Yes, so, this, so what Mr Rainey says is that this statement, uh, the witness statement containing the statement of case, which was before the first tier tribunal, would have been before the district deputy district judge. Paragraph 15 refers to Schedule 4, which Mr Rainey um, concedes was not before the district judge, but that there was sufficient evidence within paragraph 15 and 16, and presumably 17, if you look at the three paragraphs, um, that suggests that uh, this was in contemplation and that would have been sufficient for the DDJ if he'd been directed to it specifically. What do you want to say about that? Just on the contemplation point, my lady, I would perhaps then refer the court to the Willens case, um, which is at page 199, tab 13. And the point I would be making is that that was not in itself enough to show the contemplation. Right, but I think that's part of the substantive argument, and you're, you're abandoning ground three anyway, but the evidential um, basis for the incidental still remains. I just wondered if you want to say anything about those paragraphs that Mr Rainey says are sufficient, even if he doesn't succeed on the the production of the actual letter before us. I think he's saying I don't need it. So, as he said, he might have been a bit too quick on the draw to get the application in. You've got the Ladd and Marshall point, haven't you, about the actual letter? But you're still back on to the third point that Mr Rainey makes, that there's evidence in the statement. Do you concede that there is evidence in the statement? Well, I have to, my lady, concede that there is evidence in the statement because this is the, something that was before the lower court. Sufficient, I should have said sufficient evidence in the statement. Do you concede that there is sufficient evidence in the statement to establish that um, whether in contemplation or incidental, there is evidence that the local authority had turned their mind to this point? That, would, that point would be disputed, my lady. Right. And that point would be disputed, and I fear I'm again turning to the substantive point. But All right. Of course, one of my points would be that to illustrate the case of Willens again, the um, something that my London friends relies on, and a lot more was shown and a lot more was demanded of the landlord by the court in order to establish contemplation. So the contention will then naturally be that the, the mere proposition that somebody somewhere drafted a letter that nobody has seen that may or may not exist would be enough to establish contemplation on that mere one factor. All right, can you just give me a moment, please? Okay, so I think we've got the battle lines drawn on the question of whether or not there is sufficient evidence, whether or not we allow um, the letter to be admitted before us. And therefore, I think what we'll do, um, Ms Simak, is we'll move on to the appeal proper now. So you've abandoned ground three, so we've got to deal with grounds one and grounds two, and that's going to take us into the authorities bundle where you'd want to take us anyway in answer to the, the points in these uh, statements. And um, obviously there's the 
respondent's notice that um, I think will be dealt with in some ways by your arguments, but we've got that in mind too. So thank you very much. We'll go into the appeal proper now. here, I'm sure I don't have to recite it, but the issue is that, well, one large issue is whether contractual costs are recoverable at all in wider cases um, where service charge disputes arise. And that's where the court will be invited to reconcile 69 Marina and Contract Real. And the second issue, and of course the most important one for Mr. Khan here, is whether contractual costs are actually recoverable in his particular case and in his particular circumstances. The first round of appeal is that cost award made by uh, District Judge Paul with reference to uh, 69 Maria um, was wrong and that the issue is relevant to claims of, re of recovery pursuant to section 81 of the Hunt Act. The, at paragraph 12 of my skeleton, I do not propose to recite all the different features of that particular case. I've set out the um, the circumstances in which service charge is very terrible. And of course it's not disputed that there proceedings after uh, under section 146 were stopped. And of course the particular circumstances there were that there were four or five leaseholders, four leaseholders and the landlord, and the result in there will have been that if the contractual costs are not awarded, the, um, the cost will have had to be split by, in essence, two innocent parties. The main point that was raised under this ground was is that the properly applied Contract real indicates that the costs incurred um, in uh, proceedings that are in essence secondary to the main application. So first of all, they should not, what Lady Arden does there is says that in essence, the way the case was presented where the contractual costs uh, exceed manifold the main application is um, amounts to the tail wagging the dog. And that is the point that um, the appellant is seeking to make here. And of course, whilst it is clear that the basis, the factual basis are different because that is a rent case and we have a um, charges case, the analogy is still present. And, of course, there are authorities that um, confirm that uh, analogy is there and um, service charges are very often referred to, rightly or wrongly, but the court never turned the point down as an extension of a rent. And that is something that's done in 69 Marina and that's something that's done in earlier cases, such as... So um, from that point of rent and charges being tied together, the uh, point is made at, um, if I could take my Lordship's PTAP 7 in Eskew's property to um, paragraph 11 and 112 page, on page 109. So 
page 111-112. And which part of the page? H, did you say? Is it is it really B to D on page 112 you need, um, where it is more the, the, the court rejects the idea that service charge can't become rent? Indeed. Um, so, and the same uh, point is then somewhat echoed in 69 Marina, where it is in essence recognised, and that would be on... is drawn there between charges and rent, where the court sets out relevant legislation dealing with paragraph 10. And again, the very last paragraph does draw that analogy, or it could be said that analogy is there. But, but this is where on the face of it, 69 Marina is controversial, isn't it? Because uh, it seems to proceed on the basis, well, it does proceed on the basis that you need a section 146 notice even in relation to service charge, even though in Aeschylus uh, the court had said that service charge can be rent, and if you're forfeiting for rent, you don't need a section 146 notice. The point that I'm seeking to make here, it's perhaps more simplistic, is that the analogy is, if not easily, but certainly with some, with some effort, is, can be properly drawn between charges and rents. So this contract real um, being concluded, with it being concluded in contract real that those charges are not payable, then analogy can taken over to the cases of service charges, in essence, uh, establishing that uh, it's not, uh, it's contractual charge, uh, contractual um, cost is not something that is payable in any circumstances in service charge cases. So that, that is, in essence, the main point. Because the, uh, what contract trial does is uh, plainly rejects the proposition that those uh, uh, costs are recovered. And um, again, paragraph 42 to 46 of um, contract trial sets it out. What tab number is this? Eight. Number eight. Eight. Paragraphs 42 to 46, you rely on. Yeah. As well, of course, as paragraph 36 that I earlier relied on, and paragraph 41 specifically. And then, of course, that brings us to the point of it being subordinate costs to the cost of the action. I mean, just, just staying with contract real for a moment. Where it's paragraphs 44 and 45 particularly, isn't it, which are dealing with incidental to a section 146 notice. Um, uh, previously, Lady Justice Arden has been talking about incidental to the recovery of rent, I think. But at 44, she deals with the submission that the proceedings have been incidental to a notice under section 146. Um, and it's been submitted that it's immaterial that there aren't likely to be section 146 proceedings. 
uh, and so on. And then Lady Justice Arden says, the difficulty with this argument is that Section 14611 makes it clear that in these circumstances that is non-payment of rent, and notice under Section 146 is not required. There will be no intention by the landlord to serve such a notice. In all the circumstances, it seems to her that the clause can't apply. So the court's proceeding on the basis that um, no Section 146 notice is required and there is no intention to serve one. That is the point taken outside the context of the domestic because well, that was a rent case and what they were seeking to do is recover contractual costs in relation to rent. And what uh, Ms. Hegarty was doing, counsel for the landlord there, is falling back on the alternative that Section 146 will have been made back up. And that is why that point is being rejected by Lady Arden in the way that she does it in paragraph 45 of the opinion. Whereas the main point that Lady Arden is making is that, well, first of all, that a sum claimed in relation to a secondary application should not be many, many fold greater than the cost of the primary application. And, uh, um, and her summary then, secondly, is that those costs aren't payable. What happens here is, of course, that District Judge Paul, and I would refer your lordships to... Um, Pages 83 to 86 of the main point. <coughs> he didn't get the opportunity to consider the ratio of these cases in any detail. Um, and of course, my contention would be that had he been presented with these two authorities, then perhaps the outcome would be different. There was some um, Deputy District Judge Paul not referred to 69 Marina. If you look at the, the transcript of the proceedings, he's referring to the skeleton of Mr. Hardman. which refers to the case of freeholders of 69 Marina. And Mr. Hardman on page 97 of the bundle is arguing incidental means effectively those costs that have been incurred in the county court or the FTTT that is a condition precedent to us serving a 146 notice. So it's been determined in case law and it's 69 Marina. So he's, he's been referred to that decision, hasn't he? Yes, he was. The trouble is that he is referred to 69 Maria, but he, Marina, but he's not been referred to contract real. Yes, it's just that you said if he'd been, if he'd been referred to both of them, or you meant if he'd been yes. referred to both of them together. Yeah. Yes, and they're competing... Um, I would not at this stage add anything further to ground one. Why can we go behind what section? 
section, uh, what 69 Marina decided. ratio of contractual is much more logical, if I may say that, and it's much more in tune with the intentions and um, with reference to the um, Section 51 of the Senior Courts Act, because what that indicates is the uh, scope of the court's discretion is being narrowed down, and particularly with reference to um, Tribunals. And of course, it's a more general point, but it's also a trait notion that the tribunals were set up as no cause jurisdiction unless um, unreasonable behavior can be demonstrated. But we see in 69 Marina the Court of Appeals saying um, the costs incurred in the FTT proceedings, was it LVT proceedings, I forget, uh, were. Uh, incidental to the preparation of the notices and the schedules. Um, That's what the Court of Appeals said. Um, how can we go behind that? Why aren't we bound by it? Because all the difficulty, of course, is that uh, contract rail and 69 Marina are competing authorities. But um, Perhaps then, uh, that's the point I would be addressing in my later argument of uh, how much should be before the decision maker, but how, mu how much evidence should be before the judge. Because, of course, in 69 Marina, they did have actual section 146 proceedings that are determined, leave a long notice given. And uh, that, that will be the second point I will be making. That I mean, I quite follow that, but um, and that point arises even if we are bound by 69 Marina. But for us to rely on contract real rather than 69 Marina, we have to conclude that we're not bound by 69 Marina. Um, and one thing I think is you said is, well, contract real wasn't cited in 69 Marina. We don't even know that, do we? Because the law report doesn't give the list of um, authorities referred to or, or, or cited in 69 Marina. So, but of course, this court has the power to decide which of the authorities has been decided per imperial and establish a preference for whether contract real or 69 Maria should, Marina should be followed from now on. And of course, the main submission being made on the appellant's behalf is that 69 Marina, as a uh, as an established authority, should be abandoned in preference to contract real. Your case is that the Court of Appeal, this court in 69 Marina, was bound to follow contract real because it was a binding authority. And the failure to do so means it was a per incuria. Now, wh what do you say the ratio of contract real was by which the court was bound and should have followed in 69 Marina? What's, what's, what's the ratio? in Lady Justice Arden's judgment, which should have been followed and wasn't? The ratio of Lady Justice Arden um, judgment is in essence twofold, and that is, first of all, that costs are not payable in uh, proceedings such as the instance. Costs aren't payable at all in uh, rent and service charge recovery cases. So no incidental cost from the tribunal should be claimed. And that is the argument that I was seeking to back up with the general proposition that, of course, tribunals are established as no-cause jurisdictions. 
And that's something that perhaps Lady Justice Arden had in her mind when considering this case, that when people go to the employment tribunal or to the immigration tribunal or to the property tribunal, they know that they cannot recover the cost. And it is only in the property tribunals that this in essence, a back door has been created for uh, recovering contractual costs with reference to leases. But again, re returning then to the very um, proposition um, of the purpose for which the uh, tribunal was established, is that there is an expectation that there will be no cost recovery. And it is noted that the case has started in the county court, but it was redirected quite properly to the tribunal. And at that point, a respondent should recognize, any respondent should recognize that they're not going to get it. And again, the tribunal then acted properly, finding that they have no cost to, uh, they have no jurisdiction to assess costs. And on the issue of unreasonable behavior, having found that there has been unreasonable behavior, then assessment is properly made with reference to particular circumstances that unreasonable behavior wasn't of such gravity that costs should be awarded. So that should have stopped at that. I, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I understand all that. I, I understand that tribunals are set up as largely a no-cost jurisdiction. But in this particular case, the FTT did consider whether to award costs. But that's not... I mean, you may be right that it may have been in the back of Lady Justice Arden's mind, but it's not articulated by her in the contract real judgment as being the reason for disallowing recovery on under the contractual covenant to pay costs. So I don't think you, it, it, that can be the ratio. It, but however much she might have had it in, in contemplation in the back of her mind. So, so the question I asked you is, what... Do you say the ratio of contract real is by which this court was bound in 69 Marina, so it was bound to come to a different conclusion? If I refer my lordship to paragraph 36. 36. Yeah, that's the tail wagging the dog. That's the tail wagging the dog. And then, of course, she goes on to consider various authorities. Yes. But if we can go all the way down to paragraph 41. Yes. She reiterates that. Incidental to has to be treated as some so subordinate, subordinate. subordinate cost. Yes, it should be treated as subordinate cost and that those two paragraphs in essence demonstrate that secondary application, subordinate application, should not in essence have the reins between the two competing, between the two applications. And also, there is a, a clear point being made that uh, the incidental cost should not be very substantial sum indeed, and that's back to paragraph 36, and they should not be exceeding manifold the value of the initial complaint. And this is precisely what we have here. We have uh, um, a sum of 3,000 and a bit awarded to the respondent in uh, service charges, and which was notably reduced from the sum of nearly 5,000. And then we have contractual costs that are five times or six times that. And that's at the stage of the county court. Thank you. I'll move to my second ground, unless your lordships have further questions in relation to the first one. Thank you. Thank you, yes, thank you. My lady, the second point being raised here is that whether the, 
the issue of incidental to the service of notice under section 146. And of course, plainly only evidence, the contention will be that the recovery, of course, was not incidental. And that brings us back to the uh, initial submissions that there was plainly no section 146 proceeding started. The respondent now is clear that the letter they produced is a fresh piece of evidence. So the what we have here as a solid piece of evidence is the letter of claim. And that's where they stating that uh, they intend to recover from Hobbs of course. But that's of course not the letter that Mr. Khan says he received. And I do not wish to labor that point too much, but of course if you look at the history of Mr. Kant's correspondence with the respondent. It's extremely detailed. And he replies to every, sick, uh, every single letter. He writes very lengthy uh, responses. My little friend noted that he had a very lengthy skeleton argument. So the only conclusion I would invite the court to draw is the letter wasn't before him. But that's not my main point, of course. The main point is if the letter wasn't before the court, then certainly before District Judge Paul, then the way the case is presented to District Judge Paul is that notice has been served in absence. It is not clear how in absence of that letter, and I note that there is a um, second witness statement before the judge, but it is still not clear how in absence of that letter District Judge Paul agreed that the costs were incidental. It doesn't feature in any claim, appeals, decisions, or skeleton. Nothing is said about it on appeal. Yes, admittedly, reference is made to it in the um, local authorities' witnesses. But nothing is said on appeal. And again, perhaps it's less relevant, but again, they had the amended grounds. At that point, there's an opportunity to reply. And they, they, they should have triggered the response. We had the skeleton, they had the skeleton in front of uh, his Honor John Roberts. Um, so there was an ability on many occasions to refer to that letter. But what is clear, of course, returning to the actual second ground, is that that letter is not in front of this judge Paul. And another point, of course, is it, the cost cannot be incidental if there is no sum of money determined as payable and owed to the landlord. So although the actual clause 3.9 of the lease agreement, and that's at pages 100 and it's on actual, it's on actual, the actual clause is on page 177, but the entire lease is at uh, pages 172 to 194. It does refer to forfeiture proceeds. Um, what part of page 177 are you referring to? Is it paragraph 9, costs of notices under section 146 and section 147? That is the paragraph. Clause 3. 3.9, nine, yeah. Yes. And that, of course, is the, the section that uh, is cited in that.
going to three now. I, I'm halfway through the point. Oh, I'm sorry. So the the point was that even though um, there is a reference in clause three nine to the forfeiture process, it is also the case that pursuant to section eighty one subsection one of the Housing Act nineteen ninety six, a landlord cannot exercise a right to forfeit a lease for non payment of service charges specifically, including the service of Section 146 notice is precluded until such time that the first year tribunal, a court or an arbitrator have determined what sums, ex what sums exactly are payable, uh, or in the alternative, of course, if the tenant admits the sum. So until that happens, the cost cannot be incidental. And And I then cited in my discussion argument a number of authorities where the courts are hesitant to hold proceedings in much closer courses of actions and incidental to one another. And this court will be right to find that contractual cost proceedings are not closely intertwined, intertwined with any sort of proceedings to recover service charge. I just ask you, I mean, it's, it's going to the factual issue, but in, in paragraph 19 of your skeleton argument, that is controversial. It is controversial that the payment was made. Agreement for settling the debt was a main issue. So the um, debt was not extinguished. I accept that. That's an unfortunate turn of phrase in my skeleton argument. So I do have to correct myself on that. So what should it read? It submitted the conclusions recorded in the judgment of DDJ Paul were made in error, given that it was not apparently controversial the service charge debt was settled immediately following the determination made by the first year tribunal. And this is your point, that this is the, the trigger incidental to. So what, what were you meaning to say? I was meaning to say that the first year tribunal established a sum of money, an agreement was made to pay that sum of money, let's say in installments, but in any event that should not distinguish a case where a sum of money is paid as a whole from a case where a sum of money is made by installments. Yeah, well that, that may be, but so what you're saying is once the FTT determined that the sum of money was due for the past service charges, it was agreed or the appellant, Mr. Khan, submitted to that judgment, agreed that it was thereby determined that he was liable. And are you saying he agreed, he, he made that clear to the, the local authority? No, what I'm saying is once it is established that a sum of money is owed and repayment has started, there can be no forfeiture proceedings then because um, right. it would not be a natural course to follow. So, so once the payments had started... And once the respondent is clear that repayment has started and is being made on the sum awarded, then in the circumstances Starting uh, forfeiture proceedings would be a um, illogical course of action. But by Even then, the costs have been incurred. You spent the money on the FTT proceedings. So you spent the money on the FTT proceedings before any agreement has been made as to payment, and before you say it had become illogical to pursue forfeiture. Yes, you spend the money on the FTT proceedings because that's the way the tribunals work. Um, that's not to mean that um, then 
what's happening here is that the contractual costs are in essence an artificial cost uh, the forfeiture proceedings are artificially tied to the con uh, to the service charges proceedings because the whole purpose of the tribunal is there is a dispute and both parties may spend some money figuring out whether it's five thousand pounds or three thousand pounds owed here and it is notable that it was a genuine dispute because not the entire sum of money was awarded it was substantially reduced so but given that that is determined and the uh, there is an indication that the appellant is complying with the um, with the judgment and is making the um, an effort to settle debt uh, to then uh, rely on the earlier, to then say that those proceedings were incidental to forfeiture is artificial, because no forfeiture is possible in the circumstance. But that doesn't mean it wasn't possible beforehand. Uh, my, my Lord's point is that the cost had already been expended then. It was obviously necessary to go to the first year tribunal because Mr. Khan couldn't agree with the local authority what was owed, if anything. So that was a necessary step in accordance with Section 81. That was a necessary step in order to recover the service charges. And all indications on the particular circumstances of this case is that it was a simple debt claim. They had not started this as a forfeiture action. And there's a very little indication from the way this case migrated through various courts that there was um, any uh, possibility of a forfeiture action. Because what the local authority does is they go to the county court initially, um, and the contention, of course, the backup contention, of course, would be is had they recovered the sum of money there, and had they had the costs awarded in the county court jurisdiction where costs followed the events. Uh, they wouldn't be raising forfeiture issue at all. But that takes us back to that letter, doesn't it? Which was March 2016. But that letter or May, I think. a contemplation of the possibility of ever in the future of perhaps considering forfeiture action. Well, if you look at clause 3.9, It says that the cost, charges, and expenses to be payable notwithstanding that forfeiture is avoided otherwise than by relief granted by the court. That's where perhaps the court will be invited to consider at what, where the bar should be set at the, um, the issue of incidental, because of course. Forfeiture avoided could mean that forfeiture section 100, and in fact it should mean that section 146 notice was indeed served, proceeding started, and relief was granted by the court or by agreement. And that's where cost incidental to the process would be payable naturally, because the process actually started. What's happening currently is that the notion is stretched so far that um, the court will be invited to find that the possibility of considering at some point, uh, just in essence, here what we have is letter drafted but not served, whether yes. that is enough. Yes, well, I, yes, quite. Um, so uh, you'll want to take us to the authorities, which um, Ms. Rain has already referred to in terms of in contemplation. Yeah. Because clause nine is um, yes, it indicates in whether incurred in pursuit of section one four six one four seven notices or in contemplation of the same. So is that a natural jumping off point into those authorities now? Um, indeed, my lady, I will yet again refer the court initially to the case of Billens, right. that okay. is at sub 13 and page 119. And the overall theme of the authority 
is that the court did preoccupy themselves with service there. So at paragraph 11, for example, it states that the solicitors there had served notice under section 146 as a prelude to forfeiture proceedings. Here we don't have service of section 146. So that's what sets it apart, and that's one extra piece of evidence in Ms. Willem's case. Secondly, then paragraphs 12 to 13, and that's on page 203, they go on to describe a sequence of events. And they refer the court to the email. They refer to the internal communication. They refer to the email that was sent a bef uh, week before the action um, between the client and the solicitor setting out the timing and the process. And again, the same email went on to describe a sequence of anticipated events, beginning with the issuing of a letter of claim, then progressing either to a decision or to the county court. So it shows the discussion that is quite an active and live discussion between the solicitors and the client, the, the landlord client, indicating that that is indeed something that's in the mind of the here we don't have that. I noticed that my learned friend does say that internal communication would suffice, but we don't have that information. No, but we, we've, we've got this reference to the letter of the um, May 2016, which even if it wasn't received by Mr. Khan, indicates some. would indicate on this basis um, some forethought to what may happen. Well, one of the points that can reasonably arise out of that is that it's a bit of an afterthought rather than a forethought, because, of course, that arises much later in a written statement that is dated after the proceedings. Well, no, the letter is dated, unless you're saying that the letter is misdated before the decision of the FTT, because that was 2017, wasn't it? Of course. And the letter is dated May 2016, 10th of May 10th 2016. Of course, the reference. So the issue then is the issues would then turn on the breadth of intention, my lady. Breadth of intention. Indeed. And do you cite any authority for that? For that principle? That is the position, proposition that I advance, but um, I would be referring to Willens as my best authority for that, because the sequence of events that has unfolded there and the evidence that was before the court indicates that it was indeed in the mind of the uh, legal representatives and the uh, landlord in that case is much, there's much greater evidence that we have in here. So what you're saying is that you take the principle from Willens, but it's the evidential merit in this case that falls short Indeed. of getting to the contemplation. Getting to so the it's contemplation. a factual distinction. It, Indeed. On, on the second ground, the distinction would be factual. That all, in particular circumstances of Mrs. McCann's case, it isn't enough for the court to find that there was that contemplation, uh, contemplation of the um, proceedings. And do you say that, may I just be clear about this, Mr. Mick, do you say that because there was nothing substantial before DDJ Paul? So it's a, a point that my Lord, Lord Justice Newey made, Mr. Rainey, if the letter was not physically present, although it's, you know, um, part of Mr. Rainey's argument that if someone had raised it, then somebody would have said, can I have a minute and run off and fetched it and all the rest of it. And you're saying that's all as well may be, but actually there was nothing that was capable at the time that DDJ Paul made the decision of filling that evidential vacuum. Is that your point? That is indeed my point.
in essence, here, the way this case is presented to the district judge Paul is as if notice has been served. So a lot of assumptions is made by the learned judge. And the contention overall is that there simply wasn't enough evidence before the court to find that the costs were insufficient. First of all, uh, I'll repeat the point which is, is made at paragraph one of my skeleton, and one can see it from the, uh, the narrative chronology which I submitted. But I feel I do have to say this, because my learned friend made quite a lot of what she said is the lack of uh, proportionality, for want of a better word, between the, the level of costs which were incurred and the underlying service charge debt. Um, and there are a couple of points. I mean, first of all, yes, the, the, the tribunal is somewhere where it, it is relatively easy for a tenant to resort. And indeed, even if the local authority goes to court, the court will tend to transfer it to the tribunal. But what, what this case does show, and I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, it does show exactly what happens if you do have someone who decides to run lots of defences. The FTT then dismisses them out of hand. It, it, it is not right that the service charge was reduced on anything he said. It was reduced because he'd been making payments, and I'll take you to that uh, in a moment. That's why the, the claim figure, which had started at over 4,000, had reduced to 3,000, simply because he was paying 50 pounds a month. The FTT determined that nothing in his defenses had any merit at all. And um, there are thousands and thousands of local authority tenants, and if they don't pay their service charge, and the public purse requires that they're pursued, and it can become very, very difficult to extract the money, and that's what the narrative chronology, uh, among other things, sets out to establish. Um, and if, if you do, as a, as a tenant, take you know, ev every point going, and you, uh, I hope it's not unfair on Mr. Khan, he's attempted to appeal everything. You know, you've got permission decisions in the upper tribunal, um, we haven't got the documents, it appears he even tried to judicially review, I think, the upper tribunal um, in refusing one of his permission applications. Um, and uh, you do end up with a large bill. There is a tension, however, between um, that consideration, to, you, you as the landlord, I'll put to expense. And we all know that local authorities' finances are financed by council taxpayers and by central government and, and you have limited resources. But on the other hand, the tribunal system has been set up as a largely no-cost jurisdiction, as, as Ms. Simmer said, and, and, right. and Parliament has contemplated that people should be able to take particular issues to tribunals without usually being at risk of cost. I mean, it, it's not an entirely no-cost jurisdiction, I understand that. Um, but, but there is some tension between those two desirable, desirable outcomes. I do. I, I accept that entirely, and that's, I push the point as, as far as I can in, in saying it. It's simply, it is simply background. But equally, as I've also observed, that, that some variation or otherwise on Clause 3.9 is commonly found in the long leases of dwellings. Yes. Um, where I'll get to, of course, is that they do actually vary quite considerably in how they're drafted. But uh, as whether they exist or not, it's almost invariable. The, um, I've set out uh, the, the lease and, and the key covenants in my skeleton, and I uh, don't think that, that your lordships uh, and my lady need me to take you through that um, again. I was just going to make 
um, a couple of preliminary points as, as I made in my skeleton argument just to set out the history of it. Uh, this is a paragraph 12 because it, it is important when we come to look at the Orem case and 69 Marina. Um, as a general proposition, before you forfeit a lease for breach of covenant, there are a few exceptions we don't need to bother about, a landlord has to give a notice under section 146 uh, of the 1925 Law of Property Act. And indeed, that's not the first, because I think this goes back to the Conveyancing Act of 1881. There's always been a requirement on a landlord to give a prior notice. And it's for the benefit of tenants, because it allows them to remedy the breach if it can be remedied before they face uh, the forfeiture proceedings, or indeed, in some cases, peaceable reentry. Um, it is uh, trite, and it's referred to by the Chancellor in 69 Marina, that section 14611 says that by and large, section 146 does not apply to non-payment of rent. Um, but I do make the point that service charges, uh, unless there is more, service charges are not rent. Uh, and so as a general proposition, section 146 applies to service charges, even though they are a money sum, and you have to serve a 146 notice before you could proceed to forfeit. And as I'll, uh, I hope, demonstrate in a moment, uh, the Court of Appeal in 69 Marina was very well aware of that. Um, shortly before the Housing Act 1996 came into, uh, uh, well, went through Parliament and came into force, in March 1995, in Eskless and Robinson, which a learned friend took you to, this court decided uh, a controversial point which was that if you reserve uh, service charges as rent or you deem them to be uh, recoverable as rent under the lease, then that effectively makes it rent or clothes it with the character of rent. And so you then fall within section 14611 and you don't need a section 146 notice. And, and this lease did reserve the, the service charges as additional rent. Uh, yes, uh, from a purist perspective, it doesn't actually reserve it they're as not, rent because they're it's not in the redundant. Exactly, but they are recoverable as rent in arrear, and Aeschylus specifically decides that that is enough. So, if we'd stopped at Aeschylus, you wouldn't need a section one four six notice at all. Correct, my lord. Yes, absolutely. In this case, but as I pointed out, if, for example, the lease which was considered by this court very recently in Ken Square, that didn't have those words in it. So in Ken Square, you do need a 146 notice. And uh, you, one can go through the authorities, and I think I've got a little list somewhere of looking at them. You know, some do and some don't reserve service charges as rent. There's no pattern or commonality to it. And uh, as a preliminary point, uh, as I, uh, in fact, I do have a one reference, for instance, the lease in Barrett didn't reserve the um, service charges rent. Um, as, a, as a preliminary point, although it, it has been said that 69 Marina is controversial, all it actually did was put all the leases of dwellings on the same footing. And there's no difficulty with having service charges within section 146 because that's the basic position unless the lease says differently. So all that 69 Marina did was say that the true meaning of section 81 of the Housing Act was to require a section 146 in all cases. And there, there really isn't anything more um, to that supposedly controversial point than that. Um, you say it's supposedly controversial. I think I think the Deputy President of the Land said it was controversial. Said it was controversial. It came as a bit of, of a surprise. And, and he did. Aeschylus hadn't, doesn't seem to have been cited and, and so on. Well, I'm but, going to go on to the, the, the... We're not being asked to revisit that aspect of 69 Marina. Well, well we're, we're not. Um, we're not. And it, there's a very good reason for not doing it, which is that to suggest that uh, Aeschylus was, was a source of a ground for um, looking again at 69 Marina would be to assume that the Court of Appeal didn't actually realise that ordinarily you don't need a 146 notice. And I'll take you to 69 Marina in, in a moment, but it's very obvious from the judgments, as you would fully expect. The Chancellor was well aware of the point 
he specifically states it. And he decides, uh, as do the, uh, with the agreement of the other two members of the court, that 81, Section 81 of the Housing Act changes the law. It modifies Section 14611, modifies his word. And I wonder, in a sense, whether this would be a red herring anyway. I mean, just suppose, for the sake of argument, that 69 Marina could indeed be overturned by this court on the basis that it had been decided per incuriam because Aeschylus hadn't been cited. So, of course, if you look we don't at 69 know. Marina, we don't know what was cited. But just suppose that were the case. Nevertheless, any landlord, as things stand, uh, seeking to move towards forfeiture, says to himself, well, the Court of Appeal has decided that I need to do these things. And so even if 69 Marine are ultimately a brave return, I'm not sure what bearing that would have on the application of the contractual clause. Well, certainly not up to the point where the Court decided that... Uh, up to the point that the Court... Yes. I mean, once the Court had decided that no Section 146 notice was necessary, plainly, if you jumped through various hoops you wouldn't be doing it with a view to serving a Section 146 notice. But unless and until it is decided that 69 Marina is wrong on this point, you would be doing all these things with a view to serving a Section 146 notice because you had been told by the Court of Appeal that a Section 146 notice was required. Yes, that's absolutely right, my Lord. So for the purposes of my client, it, 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 in that sense, it wouldn't matter. But 69 Marina... Whatever it is, it's just not per incuriam Aeschylus, because all that because Aeschylus is not a case. Aeschylus is not a decision about the housing act which hadn't been passed. Exactly. All, all it decides is that you don't if, that if it's reserved as rent, then that is effective to reserve it as rent, and which has the consequence you don't need a one four six notice. I mean, speaking for myself, I don't find the Chancellor's decision on this point in sixty nine Marina wholly convincing, and it, it doesn't seem to, to me to jump jump at you naturally out of the wording of a statute, but that's not it's really not here point. or there, because no. we're not being asked to say it's wrong, and I'm not at all sure we could say it was wrong, even if we thought it was wrong, well, and, that's and, but neither of you are inviting us to say it's wrong, so we are, that, that's the starting point, that you do need a section 146 notice, even where, as in this lease, the service charge is recoverable as rent. Um, well, certainly, I, that's my position, I'm rather thought the learned friend with her per incuriam argument was trying to say that 69 Marina was wrong and to persuade your lordships not to follow it. No, but uh, not on this point, on the on the point as to what incidental was. Because she said it was per incuriam contra real. She didn't say it was per incuriam Aeschylus. No, she hasn't. She hasn't said it was per incuriam Aeschylus, although um, I, I, my understanding of her skeleton argument uh, was that she was... Although she says she gets it from contract real, she is, um, as I understood it, she was saying that uh, it was wrong because you don't need a section 146 notice. No, I haven't picked that up. That, that's, uh, I might be wrong. I thought I got that. Paragraph 15, she said, the relevance of that judgment is immediately apparent. The court in contract real, having rejected the notion that section 81 could be interpreted uh, as to allow the cost recovery in lease disputes, and then she refers to 45 uh, to, sorry, 42 to 46. Perhaps I read too much into that. Well, she's focusing now on 36 and 41. Yes. Um, the, if I might... Forgive me, Miss Simak, as I shouldn't have said she. Yes. What, what I, uh, I wanted... Before I get to it, which is which is where I'm about to get to, I did just want also to draw your attention to paragraph 16 of my skeleton argument and the purpose of the cost recovery clause, because uh, I, I think it was put to to my learned friend Miss Simak in argument that it, her, her one of her contentions effectively goes behind this. But Barrett and Robinson explains what these are about. That the whole point of these clauses is that you don't end up in court. Because the process of, in the old days of serving a 146, but now you get your determination from the FTT or the county court. If the tenant is quick, they then simply pay in full. And then they say, well, we didn't, there was no relief from forfeiture because you never got to forfeit. And that's uh, what the final words of this clause are all about. Payable notwithstanding that forfeiture is avoided, as in it just doesn't happen. So, um, Melun Friend is, is wrong to say. Um, 
that it's where you've issued proceedings and maybe agreed it. These clauses are specifically where you haven't got as far as forfeiting. And that's what Barrett and Robinson uh, says at paragraphs 48 to 50, which I can take you to. Indeed, if your tenant's quick enough, there are no proceedings at all. Because the exactly. first thing the landlord does is sell the 146 notice. Yes. And the tenant says, right, well, I'll pay that, pays it, and then you haven't got any proceedings in which you can recover costs at all. That's why you need a contractual obligation to pay costs. That, that's precisely so, my lord, yes. Um, and with Section 81, you get even more opportunities because um, there's a moratorium period in Section yes. 81 after the determination, and then you would have to serve a 146 notice, and then that gives a yet further period all of which gives the tenant ample time to pay before you can ever get to forfeiture. And hence, that's what these clauses are all about. Or, as Ms Simak said, come to some agreement as to the payment of arrears exactly. by instalments, which has the same effect. Yes, there's no forfeiture. Yeah. Um, so it's very important, I submit, to keep in mind that the purpose of these clauses is specifically to deal um, uh, with, with a situation like that, although they do also cover cases where um, Section 146 notices have been given, as in 69 Marina itself. Um, I, I then, uh, I hope, did, didn't trespass on, on, the, um, the, on the court's particular territory in, in addressing the court about what the meaning of per incuriam actually is, because um, it, it's been suggested um, that... Uh, there might be a per incuriam argument about 69 Marina. I think it was raised in West India Key. But um, I, I've referred you, uh, the court here to Gohill and Gohill as a, as a summary um, of the uh, per incuriam rule. Uh, it, it is a very narrow rule, which is often forgotten by commentators when they start throwing around words like per incuriam. And uh, first of all, there, there has to be, it has to be ignorance of an earlier binding decision. And because this is not in the official law reports, it's in the landlord and tenant reports, we don't know what was cited to the court in 69 Marina. They, you have to decide the very same point, and the later decision must be demonstrably wrong as a result. And also, the, importantly, the point is made in, in the FH, FSHC Group Holdings case that it, it's essential for the court to be bound that the earlier decision not only decides the point in question, but must have done so after argument on the point and not merely assumption, even if the point forms part of the ratio. And uh, one therefore would have to look quite carefully in my submission at what counsel actually argued in contract rail, because um, counsel's principal point where all those Section 51 authorities are referred to by Lady Justice Arden is not actually about incidental to the costs of a 146 notice. It's all because of the odd wording of the clause in uh, contract. Uh, incidental to the rent proceed proceedings of the recovery of rent. Yes. So if I, perhaps now is a, a, a good moment to look at contract rail and to go, and to go through that. It's a tab eight of the authorities bundle. And if I can first of all ask, uh, ask my lady and my lords to look at page 123. Uh, at clause 9, you get the contract rail clause. And um, it is in a rather different form to all of the other clauses. Uh, in particular, um, it, it doesn't have anything here about uh, the wider words of contemplation of or for the purposes of, which appear in most of the cases. Um, it is of and incidental to the preparation and service of, then you've got the reference to 146. But at Roman 3, you've got an additional clause, which was the focus of counsel's argument, proceedings for the recovery of any of the rents reserved. So because of the particular clause, the focus of the argument was whether the costs of the FTT were of and incidental to the preparation and service of proceedings for the recovery of any of the rents reserved. Um, and that's worth bearing in mind when there's an observation by Lady Justice Arden about the tail wagging the dog, uh, because 
one of her points was, well, if you could only get directly the costs of preparation and service of the recovery of rent claim, how can you get the entire costs of the logically prior claim, Section 81 declaration, as often incidental to preparation and service of the second claim? And I'll show you where that appears, but that's one of the points she's making. So uh, that's the clause. I can now ask uh, uh, the court to turn to paragraph 19, please. Uh, this is the appellant's submissions. So first submission, submission one, is one which doesn't arise in this case, which is that the proceedings under section 81 were for the recovery of rent. So that's the first thing that the Court of Appeal had to deal with, and it doesn't arise in any of the other cases. Submission number two uh, is in the sixth line, where it says, alternatively, she submits that the costs of these proceedings, that's the Section 81 claim, are incidental to the proceedings for the recovery of rent. And then she says it was necessary for the service charge to be determined before the landlord could forfeit the lease. See section, and it's a typo, it's section 81 of the 1996 Act. So those two principal submissions do not mention at all the argument that the costs of the section 81 claim were of and incidental to the 146 notice. And then one, one sees these, these arguments then. Uh, uh, deconstructed by the uh, by the court. So, paragraph thirty-three. Uh, sorry, I, I should paragraph thirty. You get the respondent's argument, which is one two six to one two seven. Uh, for the respondents, Mr. Rowe submits that first of all, these proceedings were not for the recovery of rent. So that's submission number one knocked out. Um, and then at the top of the page, 127, he further submits the costs in one set of proceedings could not be incidental to the costs of the other proceedings. In this regard, he refers to the authorities under Section 51. That's the second submission. Again, it has nothing to do with of an incidental to a 146 notice. And then at paragraph um, 33, Lady Justice Arden just disposes very shortly of the argument that proceedings after the recovery of rent, and she just says, well, they're just not. Sorry, which paragraph are you on? Paragraph 33. Yeah. It, it's quite short, but because it's a very short point, she just says it's just wrong. They're just not proceedings for the recovery of rent. Um, and she points out that the landlord hadn't, in fact, demanded rent because they were worried about waiver. Um, so that dealt with that. Paragraph 34 is the point I was making by reference to the, the, the tail wagging the dog. She says that Lady Justice Arden observes that if, uh, if the proceedings had been for the recovery of rent, the only cost you could have got under the clause would be of an incidental to preparation and service. And that's a, a rather narrow little contractual trap which doesn't exist in any of the other cases. Paragraph 35 is submission number two. Submits that Ms. Hegarty submits the costs of these proceedings were incidental to future proceedings for the recovery of rent. Again, no 146 reference there. And then paragraphs 36 to 43 are all disposing of this submission. Because paragraph 43, which is at page 129, says, for all those reasons, I reject Miss Hegarty's submission that the costs of these proceedings are costs of an incidental to some further proceedings for the recovery of rent. Nothing again to do with whether they're incidental to the service of a section 146 notice. And it's because the, the unusual 
contractual clause in contract real tied two sets of proceedings together, that it was relevant for the Respondents' Council and for the Court of Appeal to say, well, this brings directly into question the Section 51 cases about two different sets of proceedings. Uh, and those cases are not um, relevant in the same way to whether or not uh, costs of a Section 81 claim are often incidental to the service of a Section 146 notice. Uh, and that's a point which uh, Judge Cook makes in the Upper Tribunal in Ken Square. The only point where Section 146 uh, does come in is that, is that at paragraph 44, you get an additional submission creeping in, which is finally Miss Hegarty submitted that the charging clause applied because these proceedings were incidental to a notice under Section 146. And so that's the only point where 146 comes in. And the way uh, Lady Justice Arden uh, dealt with that is simply saying, well, you don't need a Section 146 notice. And that is based quite clearly in my submission on uh, a concession or a, uh, an assumption by counsel that Section 81 didn't change the underlying law on that. Because in paragraph 44, at the end of the fourth line, Ms. Heggard counsel is, is recorded as saying, submits it is immaterial that there are not likely to be Section 146 proceedings. And that if the court didn't hold that you could get costs under this part of the clause, the landlords would be encouraged to serve Section 146 notices unnecessarily, as in where the law doesn't require you to do it. Uh, now, that's a completely unconvincing argument that you can serve a 146 notice that you don't have to in order to trigger the contractual clause. Uh, and Lady Justice Arden rejects it at paragraph 45. She says the difficulty with this argument is that 14611 makes it clear that in these circumstances a notice under 146 is not required. Therefore, there, there'll be no intention for, by the landlord to serve such a notice. In all the circumstances, it seems to me that part of the clause can't apply. In other words, you can't, you can't have an intention to give a, a notice you don't need, or perhaps another way to put it is, it would be a worthless piece of paper. It wouldn't really be a 146 notice. So that, that's the way that is disposed of. What, what Lady Justice Arden does not say here is that the costs are not of and incidental to a Section 146 notice, which is where uh, Miss Hegarty began in the first two lines of paragraph 44. And you might have thought she would have done, since she'd already spent a page and a half saying they were not of and incidental to a second set of proceedings. And so, certainly in, in respect of my learned friend's um, argument about um, the, the purring curiam and whether or not the of an incidental is wrong in 69 Marina, however she puts it. Um, contract Real doesn't, in fact, decide that point at all. And it, it's very clear that it's all to do with the fact that it was assumed you didn't need a 146 notice. Uh, if one then uh, also looks at the second judgment, which is of Mr Justice Wright, uh, which you find on paragraph 133. Uh, because of paragraph 68, uh, he says, I agree with my lady. In the third line, he says, the costs incurred were not of an incidental to the preparation and service of a section 146 notice, since no such notice was necessary to support a claim for forfeiture because the service charges had been expressly reserved as rent. So again, it, it's not that 
the prior proceedings couldn't be of an incidental to. It was simply because the court there assumed, and it is an assumption, because no one argued to the contrary, that Section 81, uh, sorry, that because they were reserved as rent, you didn't need a Section 146 notice. So the, the, the ratio of contract rail is really very narrow. And it is, I would also respectfully submit it, it is very particular to the very particular form of clause in contract rail. And apart from the wider point um, that, that one shouldn't, according to this court in Ken Square, one, one shouldn't engage in, a, in too much of a detailed compare and contrast exercise between clauses. Um, but it's very difficult, I would submit, to, to run a per incuriam argument when the court is dealing with the specific clause in a specific lease. You said the ratio was very narrow. What do you say the ratio was? Well, I, I would say that the, the ratio uh, is confined to uh, the two, the three points which arise out of the submissions of counsel. So, so far as there is a ratio, the, the first is um, that um, proceedings in the logically prior claim for a declaration under Section 81 cannot be of an incidental to a subsequent action. Well, actually, the first one is they're not proceedings for the recovery of rent. Yes. Secondly, they're not proceedings that are... The, the costs of those proceedings are not of an incidental subsequent proceeding. And then, and then thirdly, and but this is, I, I think I'd have, it is part of the ratio, but it's based on a point which isn't argued, which is that you don't, you didn't need a section one four six notice. Therefore, the costs of the prior proceedings couldn't be of an incidental to one. Yes. And you say of those three ratios, the first two have no resonance in this case simply not addressing the issue. And the third one, the 69 Marina takes a different view of whether a 146 notice is necessary, so, so that undercuts the, the reasoning. Yes, and the, the, the important point being that the, the, the point is actually raised and argued out in 69 Marina, and the court actually looks at Section 81 and decides that Section 81 modifies Section 146, and that is simply not a point which was either advanced so far as one can see from the judgment, and it certainly wasn't considered by the court in contract rail. Can you give me the second ratio? I've got one and three. Um, the, the, sorry, I put them in the wrong order, as, as, as uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Nugi said. Ratio one is that the costs of the logically prior Section 81 proceedings were not themselves proceedings for the recovery of rent. Ratio two is that the costs of those prior proceedings couldn't be of and incidental to subsequent proceedings for the recovery of rent. And ratio three is that uh, the costs of the, of the Section 81 claim could not be uh, of and incidental to a notice under Section 146 because you didn't need a 146. It's just the second one I missed. I thought it was probably best to put them in the right order, having been corrected by my lord. Um, so that then brings one to, to the Orem, uh, 69 Marina and Orem, which is at paragraph, uh, sorry, at tab 10. And um, the clause, I should always start with the relevant clause. So the relevant clause is found at the bottom of page 169. Uh, it's, it's right at the bottom of the page. Uh, and it's a covenant to pay all expenses, uh, including solicitor's costs, etc., incidental to the preparation and service of a notice under Section 146, or incurred in or in contemplation of proceedings under Section 146 of sec or Section 147, and then the key notwithstanding in any such case forfeiture is avoided otherwise than relief granted by the court. Uh, it, it doesn't have anything about proceedings for the recovery of rent, so it, it, this is a much more conventional or more commonly encountered form of costs clause. Mm. 
the argument is slightly complicated, and I've, I'm, unless you wish me to, I won't go into it. It's slightly complicated by the fact that there was another clause which effectively allowed the landlord to put costs onto the service charge, which the lessees had not, in fact, objected to. But the difference was that some of them, of course, owned the freehold company and some didn't. So whether you could get them within clause 312 changed the incidence of liability for the costs. Um, the uh, Chancellor, in his judgment, uh, recites at the top of page 171 uh, the judgment at first instance of the district judge, District Judge Nightingale. Um, district Judge Nightingale said simply that she was satisfied that the costs were within clause 1B, which is the sorry, clause 312. Um, at paragraph 6, uh, she was satisfied that uh, it didn't matter whether there had been a 146 notice because there hadn't been one at the time she gave her judgment. So that was what the district judge said. Uh, paragraph 8 at the bottom of the page recites the judgment on first appeal before his honour Judge Hollis. Um, at paragraph 10, he said quite shortly, the district judge concluded the costs before the tribunal should fall under clause 312. Although she doesn't go into the details, it must be the case that in deciding that she was taking the view that the costs fell, in, it must be the case in deciding that the costs fell incidental to the or in contemplation of the preparation and service of proceedings under 146 or 147. That's a perfectly reasonable view to have come to. So that was a uh, an either or. So it was either incidental to or it was in contemplation of. And that's, uh, that is relevant when we get to the end of the judgment. Uh, and then the key passages begin at page 172, paragraph 10 onwards. Um, paragraph 10, the Chancellor begins by saying, I start with section 146. Its precise terms are too familiar to require repetition. So the Chancellor was certainly saying that he was very familiar with section 146. Um, at the end of that paragraph, he records specifically that counsel for the lessees points out that subsection 11 provides that the section as a whole does not affect the law relating to re-entry or forfeiture in the case of non-payment of rent. So he knows very well, because he says so, that you don't need a 146 notice if it's non-payment of rent. He then refers to section 18 of the 1985 Act um, and the definition of service charge, paragraph 11. Paragraph 12, he then refers to Section 81 of the Housing Act. And at the end of that paragraph, uh, he says, given that the definition of service charge includes an amount payable as a part of the rent, the evident intention is that the Section 146 procedure, as modified, is to be applicable in cases of non-payment of a service charge, even when such charge is recoverable as part of the rent. Now, that, that alone kills off any argument about Aeschylus. He's he realises, as one might expect, being the Chancellor, that you don't need a 146 notice if it's non-payment of rent, and he is simply saying, although at this stage no doubt it is a provisional view because he hasn't referred to Council's argument yet, um, he is saying that it doesn't matter. Section 81 applies it, and that's, I say, what modified means. He knows he's modifying Section 146 so that you have to have a 146 notice in all cases. Paragraph, uh, I don't think I need to take you to paragraph 13 and 14, which are recitation of a couple of other statutory provisions. Um, paragraph 16, we get to uh, the argument about for counsel for the lessees. Counsel for the lessees makes two submissions. One, the service charge was recoverable as rent. So 146 is not in point. Two, freeholders' costs incurred in the tribunal are not incidental to the preparation and service of a 146 notice or service of notices and schedules relating to wants of repair. Paragraph 17. I didn't understand freeholders' counsel to dispute the fact of the payments. 
or the proposition that what was in dispute was the balance of costs. She then says um, that there had to be preparation of the schedules and notices and, and the application to the tribunal, this is at the top of 174, in order to be in a position to serve a section 146 notice. So she's, despite the submission for the lessee, she claims all of the costs as costs incidental to and preparatory to the service of a 146 notice. These submissions, if correct, would dispose of the first two submissions of counsel for the lessees. So these submissions, if correct, shows that the Chancellor was saying, well, are they correct? Paragraph 18, I prefer the submissions of counsel for the freeholders. And um, he refers in the middle of paragraph 18, it's a service charge, it can't be enforced except in accordance with the terms of section 81 of the Housing Act. And in the case of a long lease, he refers to section 168. And at the end of the paragraph, he says, each of those sections requires or recognizes that even when so determined, the enforceability of enforcement of that liability is subject to the <coughs> provisions of section 146, even if the lease treats it as an additional rent recoverable as such. So he specifically, again, making the point that um, section 81 modifies section 146. None of this argument and consideration of Section 81 appears in contract drill. Um, and then uh, at paragraph 20, he says, in those circumstances, the district judge was right to have concentrated on the terms of Clause 312. And then he sets out both limbs of or in contemplation of, uh, uh, in contemplation of proceedings under 146 or the costs of schedules of wanting to repair. Then you get at the end of 20, given the determination of the tribunal under 146 notice are cumulative conditions precedent. So again, he's repeating the point that you need that. He says, it's my view clear that the freeholders cost before the tribunal fell within the terms of clause 312, if and insofar as any of them may not have been strictly costs of the proceedings, they're incidental to the preposite they're incidental to the preparation of the requisite notices and schedules. So what he's there um, is saying, in, in my submission, is that effectively they're both. They're both in contemplation of, and they're also incidental to. Is he, is he relying on in contemplation of? I mean, if one looks at A, it's expenses incurred in or in contemplation of. So when he says if and insofar as any of them may not have been strictly costs of the proceedings, is he relying on contemplation of or is he relying on in? He's at any rate, he, he moves to B when he gets to the incidental to. Well, it, it's, it's a point which was made by Judge Cook in Ken Square, which is that it, you then have to also look at paragraph 21 before we finish considering what the Chancellor meant. Because at paragraph 21, he deals with the first instance judges. He says, the district judge considered this matter before there was a 146 notice. That accounts for her conclusion in paragraph 6 of her judgment and the decision of the circuit judge in paragraph 10. Whilst neither of them spelt out the exact nature of the liability of the lessees under clause 312, there's no doubt as to their conclusions. I agree with them. This disposes of the first two submissions. And what Judge Cook suggests in Ken Square is that you do then have to go back uh, and ask yourself what the district judge and the circuit judge were deciding. Well, they said it fell within Clause 312, even though there hadn't been a 146 notice at the time. So he's agreeing with that proposition. And uh, Judge Hollis says that the district judge meant incidental to or in contemplation of both. So the, the agreement with Judge Hollis at, at paragraph 21 suggests that the Chancellor was deciding on both limbs. And when you say both limbs, you don't merely mean A and B. You Sorry, mean I don't mean B at all. You mean incidental. Thing. Yes. For my purposes, the, the, those are the two limbs. I appreciate in, in this case you have the additional point about notices and schedules relating to ones of repair. So 
I mean contemplation of and incidental to, he decides both. And having looked at contract rail, as we did before, I submit you put those two cases alongside each other, it's simply not possible to argue that 69 Marina is per incuriam contract rail. Um, contract rail's ratio is very narrow. Uh, it doesn't deal with the point as to whether Section 81 actually uh, requires a 146 notice, even though you wouldn't ordinarily need one. The point's just not taken at all. It is taken, and it's decided in, in 69 Marina. Um, 69 Marina decides that the uh, costs of the prior proceedings are either in contemplation of, that's not the point which arises in contract rail at all, or incidental to, that is a point which did arise in 69 Marina, but it's only disposed of on the basis that you don't need a 146 notice. There's no finding that they can't be incidental to because of the Section 51 costs cases, which is the gravamen of ground two. So for those reasons, although um, 69 um, Marina has been described as controversial and the, the word per incurium has been thrown about, when one actually analyzes it, sets out the per incurium test, puts the two next to each other, it isn't per incurium. There may be people, um, my lords have suggested, there are people who've suggested and um, judges who've suggested that the decision about Section 81 is surprising. My Lord, Lord Justice Nugie said, didn't find the, um, I don't want to misquote my Lord, didn't, didn't find it entirely convincing or something like that. Um, didn't leap out from the language. Didn't leap out from the language. But 69 Marina is the case on the point, and it is binding on this court unless it is per incuria. Uh, and not only is it um, a, a case which is uh, the binding authority on the point, it's a case which has actually been followed over and over again. I mean, Barrett and Robinson, there's a criticism of it, but of course it's said to be high authority for the proposition. Uh, now you might say, well, these are just lower tier judges lo loyally applying it. Nevertheless, it's, it's not one of those decisions which can be said to be causing any difficulty in practice. It's quite easy to apply. Um, in fact, it makes the law far simpler because you know that you need a 146 notice in all service charge cases and not just those where it's reserved as rent. Um, that, that point about loyally uh, applying the law, uh, I think in fairness to Deputy District Judge Paul, I should say orally what I said in my skeleton argument. Even if, six, even if contract rail had been cited to him, I would submit that as a Deputy District Judge, he really had to follow 69 Marina, even if he'd been told it was per incuria. It's not for him to decide. It's not for him to decide that. That's what Rooks and Barnard says. So it's wrong to criticize him for simply following 69 Marina. Um, and I would say he would have been right to follow it, even if a per incuriam argument had been raised. Um, th that, no doubt, of course, is why His Honour Judge Roberts gave permission for the leapfrog appeal, because Judge Roberts would have been equally bound loyally to apply 69 Marina. Um, and in fact, this case actually demonstrates the wisdom of it, because when you do get the time um, and the resources to investigate and deal with it at length as a discrete point, you then, in my respectful submission, discover that it's actually not per incuriam at all. So you're hoping that Woodfall will take note of any judgment of this court if it's in, in line with your submissions? Because they're the ones that float the pure in, per incuriam argument, aren't they? Um, so I'm not, I didn't quite follow. The, the, the text, um, it may be that um, Ms. Simak and others pick up on the per incurium point from the uh, opinions of the authors of uh, that particular part of uh, it Woodfall. Yes. Yes. And because they're, they're the ones that raise it. Yes, and th there have been one or two articles, I think. I mean, my friend hasn't produced them. But yes, but that's what you're hoping to lay to rest by your submission. Yes. Yes. In my submission, it, it should, one should. Uh, okay. Sorry, just help me. Where it has been suggested that 69 Marina is per incurian, 
Is there anything saying per incurium contract real, or is it all per incurium Aeschylus or other things? Um, I, I confess I didn't go back and check all of the articles which were written um, to see whether any of them actually referred to contract real. The, the one we do have in the bundle, which is Barrett and Robinson, which is then repeated in West India Key, that is the argument by reference to Aeschylus. Um, and I, I could produce them if I needed to. I then did, I checked Carr and Del Bounty and Mohammedi and Anston, which are also referred to by the deputy president in Barrett. But, well, Carr and Del Bounty was in relation to a first instance decision, which was before the act ever came into force. Um, and all it simply, it's, it says that service charges reserved as rent, you don't need a 146 notice, in a case where they were actually not reserved as rent. So the point didn't arise. Mohammed and Aniston, Anston, I also checked. Um, that's another case where it wasn't reserved as rent. So again, the, the point didn't arise. And it simply says in passing, which would be obiter, since the point didn't arise. It says, well, Aeschylus says you don't need one if it's reserved as rent. But on the facts of the case, you did. So if we had had to go into that, I, I would have um, respectfully submitted that that was also a bad line of argument. Yeah. Um, but as, a, as I say, I, I confess I didn't, I didn't go digging. You, you, your submission simply doesn't arise. No. 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 Nevertheless, uh, I understand entirely why you, you've made the submissions you had, but it does lead to this result, that in contract real, Lady Justice Arden thought the costs of Section 81 proceedings, if I can call them that, before the tribunal, were not incidental to future proceedings for recovery of, of rent, but in 69 Marina, and you say in this case, the costs of Section 81 proceedings are incidental to the Section 146 notice or Section 146 proceedings. Yes. Is there a tension there between, between those two? We can see they're not entirely inconsistent, but they don't seem to be marching in the same direction. I'm not sure whether they're marching in the same direction. I, I would I would say that the the difference is that Section 81 and also Section 168, which applies to other non-money breaches. Um, the point about those is that they set a condition precedent to the service of a Section 146 notice, as well as requiring one. Yeah. And so it, it's very easy to submit that if you want to serve a 146 and you've warned the tenant about it and you have to jump through a hoop to get there, then the costs of jumping through the hoop are of an incidental to the service of the 146 notice. Of course, you've got to do it first. Yes. And, and Whereas you, you don't have to take Section 81 proceedings to recover rent. No, but you, would, you, would, you would simply uh, have to uh, obtain a, a declaration effectively from the court. So if you look at the um, wording of Section 81 as to what you are and are not permitted to do, page nine is it? It is at page nine. It's all about restricting the exercise of forfeiture. So you can issue, you can issue a writ or you can, county court, claim form in the county court for debt for, for debt for a service charge without going through the section eighty one proceedings. If, absolutely. If there's a dispute as to quantum, the county court might well send it off anyway because the tribunal's a specialist tribunal. But but it's not a precondition. It's not a it, precondition of the debt claim. To issuing a debt claim. No, and one's bound to observe there's a certain circularity because of course the section eighty one uh, determination. It can be achieved in that debt claim. Yes. So the, the debt claim, in fact, was brought here. My, my client issued a county court claim for debt. And the purpose of that was as a prelude to serving a Section 146 notice, we say on, on the evidence, um, if nothing else, in the evidence of Ms. Iqbal's statement. But you don't have to do it. You could, and I suppose this is the point about having some investigation of the landlord's state of mind, you could simply issue a debt claim for the want of issuing a debt claim.
And the other thing you can do is you could apply directly to the tribunal for a determination. And why, did, why, did, why didn't you do that? I mean, it seems... Because there wasn't a defence. Sorry, say that again. Because there wasn't a defence, my lord. So it's not a case where you know there's a dispute and there's a question of whether costs are incurred reasonably or unreasonably and so on. It's simply someone who hasn't paid. Well, that was the view which was taken. The view was taken. And then you get a defence, and then it goes off to a tribunal, and the tribunal says there's no defence. Yes, I mean, in this case, I mean, in this case, the view that there wasn't a defence was absolutely right, because the tribunal did not deduct a single penny from it. Well, the, Mr. Um, Mr. Khan had made some payments um, which had reduced the amount from the 4,000 odd for which the debt claim was issued down to the 3,365 for which judgment was eventually entered. But his actual defence um, had no merit at all. And uh, that is um, set out best, in fact, uh, in the um, decision of the first tier tribunal on the costs point, which is at it's at, at page 237 of the appeal bundle. Um, at, at paragraph 21 at page 242 is the pithiest point. It says that the tribunal satisfied the respondent acted unreasonably by an objective standard. It accepts the arguments of the applicant that there were no merits in the respondent's arguments and that his actions in seeking adjournments, not attending the hearing, appealing and writing long and complex letters in connection with what was a simple service charge case was unreasonable behaviour. At no stage was anything that resembled a coherent defence to the applicant's claim presented to the tribunal. This was despite the applicant, my client, and the tribunal giving the respondent every chance to make his case. So might not always be the case, but I would respectfully submit that my client was perfectly entitled and right to just issue a debt claim, and it's unfortunate that it had to go to the tribunal to get the, the lack of defence determined. So the, the, on that basis, your client would have hoped to get the final determination from the court as to how much was owed because you didn't think there was any plausible defence which would have required reference to a tribunal. Yes. I presume you very often get a default judgment or at least a summary judgment. Yes. Well, it, summary judgment, I think, is, is more difficult because I, I don't mean this as a criticism of the district bench, but you see the word service charge, and the first thing which happens is you get an order which is transferring the question to the yes, I see. first year tribunal. Uh, and, what? It, and is it um, open to the court to do that in whatever circumstances? As I understand it, it, it I, perhaps if, if you were to demand a hearing and to emphasize to the district judge that there really isn't a defense at all, um, then it might be possible to get it. But as a general principle, if, if any form of document is put in um, which, basic, which disputes the uh, service charge in any form, even if it's not a proper or coherent defence, it will simply be sent to the first tier tribunal. Is this but a matter of invitation? I'm terribly sorry. Absolutely. Well, I was going to say, that I think there's a statutory provision somewhere saying that service charges can only be recovered if reasonable. And the onus is on the landlord to show they're reasonable. That is right. So all the tenant needs to do is say, I don't think these charges are reasonable, without actually needing to say any more at all, and, and he's raised an arguable issue. Yes, and it, it will be transferred. Yeah. It's and part what may? Pretty much, my lady. What, what, what may happen now is there's a, there's a jurisdictional pilot, as, you, as you'll be aware, the double-hatting pilot, where mm. in that all first-tier tribunal judges are ex officio judges of the county court. So you can transfer the service charge part to the tribunal for determination. And also, then, um, the case is then allocated to the same first-tier tribunal judge sitting as a judge of the county court to deal with the county court bit of it. And then it gets heard and administered in the tribunal justice centre um, 
So I mean, there's a tribunal justice centre in Havant, which is separate from the local county courts, but what happens is the service charge and enfranchisement as well, I think, cases end up there, and the same judge quotes double hats and decides both parts of it. So well, he only decides the service charge is reasonable and recoverable, but then gives judgment in, in uh, exercise of the powers of the county court. Yes. So it becomes a county court debt, which is then... Yes, it's supposed to shortcut it, but Avon and Child shows that if you don't pay very, very close attention to which jurisdiction you're sitting in at which point, then you end up making orders which are... You have to keep taking the right hat. Yes, off and, and on, yeah. the tribunal, for example, would often sit with a judge and a, a, a wing member, a surveyor, for example, who will deal with the FTT part, but the surveyor member shouldn't be sitting in the county court part because they're not judges of the county court, unless they're appointed as an assessor, presumably. But yes, it, subject, to, subject to that pilot service charges, if, the, if there's any form of dispute, and as my, my lord says, it's quite easy to raise it, they, they end up transferred off. With an eye to the time, just one final question. Is it um, possible for um, one of the parties in the debt dispute to invite the district judge or the county court to transfer it to the tribunal because they have hopes of a more specialised um, overview? Or, or is it simply down to the judge as to whether or not they're going to transfer? Um, it, it would always be possible for one of the parties to make an application if for whatever reason it had not been retained in the court. Usually it would be the defendant because the claimant would have deliberately started in the court. But yes, you can make an application for transfer. And you can make argument against transfer, presumably, in that case. In, in principle, you could. And in this case, would it take place, that argument against transfer? Uh, no, I think that the, uh, the order, I'd have to check, and I'll check over the shorter general, yeah. I think the order was made in box work, um, okay. transferring it. Okay, that's usually on an application, though, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure that this particular order was, because the court transfers things of its own motion quite frequently in this kind of uh, case. We just Shall I leave to... you to look at that over the short adjournment? Yes, my lady. Can you give us an idea of how much more you've got to go, Mr Rainey? Um, I, I think I can truncate on that basis most of my skeleton argument about the, the first two grounds, and it would probably be largely the respondent's notice. Right. points which I deal with this afternoon. So give me a clue. How um, long? Well, I need to give my learned friend time to respond. So, I mean, I, I would hope not to be more than an hour. Right, OK. OK. Thank you very much. Um, right, so um, five past two, please. <laughs>